Welcome to the course on plasma physics and applications. Today we will continue our discussion on how we can heat the plasma and drive current in it using waves. After a brief reminder of the fluid dispersion relation, that is the condition that we need to impose in order for the waves to propagate in the plasma, and a brief reminder of the concept of wave particle resonance, which is the mechanism by which we transfer energy from the wave to the plasma, we will focus on the electron cyclotron resonance heating system. We will see at uh, some degree of detail what are the physical mechanisms that are behind it, how we can avoid the reflection layers for the wave in the plasma that we refer to as cutoffs, in order to reach the absorption layers in the plasma that we refer to as resonances. And how we can use the two polarizations that characterize the perpendicular propagation of the, pla of the wave in the plasma in order to do that, the ordinary and the external ordinary mode. We will see how we can build a source of microwaves that gives the power that we need to heat the plasma at the frequency we need to operate, that is the gyrotron. And then we will illustrate a couple of examples of actual systems that are based on the ECRH principle to heat the plasma and drive current to it. One that already operates in a, an actual tokamak, the system on the TCV tokamak here in Lausanne, and the system that we foresee for ETA. As a brief reminder, I just uh, highlight the fact that in magnetized plasmas, we can have the propagation of many modes. And these modes can be used to transfer energy, typically via an antenna or a launcher, to the plasma core. That's the basic principle of heating the plasma using waves. But I'd also like to remind that the frequency and or the wavelength of these waves must be chosen in order to satisfy the plasma dispersion relation. That is the condition for the wave to exist and propagate in the plasma. We also need to choose a scenario that is a combination of frequency and wavelength in order to allow the wave to deposit its energy in a layer that corresponds to the plasma resonance, typically in the plasma core. Again, as a reminder, I just uh, highlight that the fact that we have found that in a fluid model, there are no cyclotron resonances for propagation other than along the magnetic field of the plasma. This is a dispersion relation that we found in a fluid model in the direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. And we see that the resonances corresponding to the situation in which the wave number goes to infinity for a finite frequency correspond to the lower hybrid and upper hybrid frequencies respectively. So no resonance for the cyclotron frequency. However, we have uh, already uh, seen in the last lecture that in the kinetic model, that is the model that goes one step beyond the fluid approach, considering that the velocity of the particles are not all the same, so we have distributions that characterize the plasma. In this model, the wave particle resonances exist and occur when the frequency seen by the moving particle, which is, of course, the frequency that we launch in the plasma, Doppler shifted by the k dot b term, corresponds either to zero, which means the plasma wave moves with a phase velocity that corresponds to the velocity of the particle, or to multiples of the cyclotron frequencies. So we do have cyclotron resonances in this uh, more advanced model, even for waves that do not propagate along the magnetic field. So the game here is to reach these resonances, avoiding the cutoffs, which are the reflection points. Reflection points that are characterized by an index of refraction going to zero, that is typically finite omega and a wave number going to zero. And although the resonance cannot be identified by the fluid model, at least in perpendicular propagation or oblique propagation in general, the cutoffs can. And in fact, in this uh, dispersion relation that we have already seen before, we can identify uh, already uh, cutoff points such as omega L and omega R for the extraordinary mode, the mode in which the oscillating electric field is perpendicular to the ambient magnetic field, or the omega P cutoff, which is the well-known cutoff for the ordinary mode, which corresponds to the polarization of the wave such that the oscillating electric field of the wave is actually parallel to the ambient magnetic field. 
So these are sort of a general concepts that apply to different kinds of waves, and we're now focusing on the electron cyclotron resonance heating scheme. The idea here is to transfer power to the electrons at the cyclotron resonance or at its harmonics. If I take the fundamental cyclotron uh, frequency, so uh, n equals 1, if you like, in the previous expression, and if I express that in terms of gigahertz, the value that I have is about 28 times the magnetic field expressed in Tesla. So for a 3 Tesla device, we have something of the order of 100 gigahertz of frequency for the electron cyclotron resonance. Now at these high frequencies, the vacuum wavelength are uh, relatively small, so they are in a millimeter range. That implies that the wave propagates in a quasi-optical manner. Also that the wave is a reason why described in the Fourier formalism, and one can use radio beam tracing to describe the propagation of it into the plasma. And because the wave is a, a sort of a well-focused beam, we can have local absorption and therefore local heating and even local uh, current drive. Another important point is there is no need for an antenna to be placed inside the plasma because of this uh, quasi-optical propagation of the wave. We need to have a launcher and or a mirror to steer the beam in the direction we'd like to go. The polarization of the wave can be uh, determined by uh, different components and controlled by the orientation of the waveguides and mirrors. If we inject the wave with a parallel wave number that's not zero, in other words, we give it a direction um, with a component along the magnetic field that's not zero, we can drive current with the wave. So now we have to choose the frequency and the polarization that are adequate to guarantee two things to guarantee what we call accessibility, that is, again, to reach the resonance, avoiding the cutoff, which it normally is implied by the presence of a density that's too high. I notice that, in fact, there is no minimum density requirement for this scheme, as opposed to ICRH and low hybrid, and also in order to have a good power absorption in the plasma. First scheme we can think of is the so-called ordinary mode, as I said before, this is a mode in which the wave electric field is parallel to the ambient magnetic field. So let's illustrate the scenario that we can uh, operate with. This is my tokamak plasma cross-section. I'm coming for practical reasons from the low field side, that is from the outside part of the tokamak, and I inject my wave in a radial direction, perpendicular to B0, to the ambient magnetic field. Now, this is the ordinary mode. So if I take a, a reference frame here, I would have a propagation that would be in the radial direction, a wave electric field that will be aligned with the magnetic field. Of course, the wave electric field will oscillate um, up and down in its sign. And from the plasma point of view, we need to consider where are the cutoffs and where is the resonance. Suppose I choose a frequency for my wave that corresponds to the cyclotron frequency at the center of the plasma, or roughly at the center of the plasma. I like to reach that resonance, but what do I have to uh, make sure of? I have to make sure that I don't hit a cutoff before that. The cutoff for the ordinary mode is the plasma frequency cutoff. So there will be a region that will be inaccessible to my wave because the uh, frequency will correspond to a density that will be larger than the cutoff density. Let me illustrate that in a profile of the density itself. The black region above the cutoff density is inaccessible. So in the example here, I have my wave coming, and before it reaches the resonance, which is corresponding to the wave frequency being equal to the local cyclotron frequency, and I was hoping that that would be in the center, I hit the cutoff related to the omega p, to the plasma frequency, which you have seen in the previous part of the course. So I can't have access to this resonance I was trying to reach. The only way I can uh, go about that is to reduce the density in order to reach the resonant frequency corresponding to FCE before I reach the corresponding cutoff. So, say I take uh, a lower density, and I can 
indeed hit the plasma by hitting the resonance before I reach the uh, cutoff, which corresponds to the reflection point. So, all mode heating is possible, but only up to a certain density value. Let us now explore a second option that we have for depolarization, the so-called extraordinary mode, or X mode, in which the oscillating field of the wave is perpendicular to the magnetic field. As you have seen, the dispersion relation for this mode is uh, quite different from the ordinary mode. So let's consider first the first harmonic, that is we have a frequency of the wave roughly chosen to be corresponding to the resonance frequency of the electron cyclotron motion at say the plasma core. So I draw my uh, tokamak, I inject as before from the low field side with say a, a waveguide that launches the waves towards the core. Polarization now is different. We have the wave electric field that's perpendicular to the ambient magnetic field and the wave vector that is perpendicular to both and is directed in the radial direction. So we have, say, the cyclotron frequency roughly in the center. That's the FCE resonance. But for the extraordinary mode, we also have the upper hybrid resonance whose uh, shape is dictated by the combination of the magnetic field and of the plasma density. And we have the X mode cutoff, which is well represented by the fluid dispersion relation, which is to the right hand side of the upper hybrid resonance. So this is my resonance, upper hybrid resonance, and this is the cutoff layer. So in fact, that means there's a forbidden area for propagation between the two. And if the wave comes from the low field side, it's bound to meet first the cutoff layer before it can have a chance of meeting the upper hybrid or the electron cyclotron resonance. So this cannot work because the wave cannot reach any resonance. So what can we do to improve the situation? Well, the idea is to go to higher harmonics, say the second or even third harmonic of the electron cyclotron frequency. Let's take the example of the second harmonic. The frequency of the wave will be chosen to correspond roughly to two times the electron cyclotron frequency, say in the plasma core or close to the center. I'm still coming from the low field side with my wave, exact same way as before. The electric field perpendicular to B0 and with the wave vector that's directed radially. And why does this help me? What have I done to improve the situation? Well, I've, I've essentially taken the, the first harmonic resonance and the upper hemi resonance and the cutoff all the way to the left. I have moved them all the way to the left so that they can be, the FC uh, can even be outside the plasma, it doesn't really matter anymore. Upper hybrid would be somewhat in the plasma, of course. This is my upper hybrid layer. This is the X mode cutoff. But the point is that the resonance that I'm trying to reach, which is the two times FCE resonance is now in front of the cutoff layer. So my wave coming from the right can indeed hit that resonance before it hits any cutoff layer. So before it's reflected back from the plasma back to the antenna in the launcher. So this is a situation which we can envis envisage to uh, hit the plasma and even uh, if we direct the wave in a particular direction, drive current non-inductively through it. Now we know that we can't really continue this game. We can, we can think of having the third harmonic also, and therefore increase the density value corresponding to the, the X mode cutoff. But we can't do that indefinitely because we have, first of all, a reduced absorption efficiency as we go to higher and higher harmonics. A second of all, it will become difficult to have the availability of a high power source at such an 
increasingly high frequencies. In fact, as we say, the fundamental frequency for a, a 3 4 Tesla device is of the order of 100 gigahertz. If we take the second harmonic of uh, that will be uh, 200 uh, gigahertz, which is already quite difficult for high power source. And what kind of power sources do we have in this range? This is uh, illustrated in the picture where we can see the power that the sources can provide on a logarithmic scale, say 110 kilowatt and 1 megawatt, as a function of the frequency. 100 gigahertz is in this range, where we can see that the power that can be provided by relatively simple and, and conventional sources such as the traveling wave tube, um, amplifier, or the magnetron, or the klystron is actually very, very small. And we're not yet in the frequency range where lasers can provide power. So can we have as a source, we have something that's called a gyroton. That's typically the source that covers um, 10, 200, 150, 200 gigahertz range of frequency. What is a gyroton? Let's look at the basic principles behind its functioning in very simple terms. The function is based on the so-called cyclotron resonance maser instability, which is a relativistic effect associated with the bunching of the electron motion as they gyrate around the field lines. There are three essential components in a gyroton. There's an electron beam that's annular, which is uh, uh, produced by a cathode here, illustrated in this uh, shaded area. The electron beam propagates in the axial direction here, guided by a strong magnetic field, which is produced by the coils of which we see the cross sections here, which again confine the electrons, but also determines the frequency which they gyrate around the field lines. And uh, where the electron beam propagates and where the magnetic field is produced and where it's uh, actually flat in its uh, intensity, we have a resonant cavity. And that's the third component of the gyrotron. It's uh, essentially a cylinder with a smoothly varying cross-section. And this resonant cavity allows a resonant interaction between the electrons and the modes in the cavity. Again, a wave particle resonance, the same kind that we're actually using in, a, in some sense to heat the plasma once the wave is launched into it. So what remains to be done is simply to extract the energy from this cavity using a window in the form of a particular polarization for an electromagnetic wave that will propagate in waveguides all the way to our tokamak plasma. Naturally, we need to dump the energy of the uh, remaining uh, electrons that have passed through the cavity and they have provided the energy or part of their energy to the uh, electromagnetic wave in the cavity. Here we see a broken uh, view of the gyroton, its layout. Once again, there's a cathode on this side, the annular beam, which is now uh, represented in, in yellow color, the guiding magnetic fields, which are produced by a superconducting coil, typically, the resonant cavity, and the output window through which we extract the electromagnetic wave um, in the form of a beam. The window typically needs to uh, allow close to 100% of the power to be extracted, so it has to absorb very, very low amounts of the microwave power and typically is made of a CVD diamond. And then we, of course, have the collector that uh, collects the electrons and their remaining energy. Let's look at the layout of a, an existing ESRA system. That's the system that we have on the TCV tokamak in Lausanne. It's two kinds of uh, sources at two different frequencies. All of them are, are gyrotons. We can see here the different sources installed um, tens of meters away from the tokamak and connected to the tokamak by uh, oversized, overmoded waveguides, which guarantee the transport of uh, the uh, wave energy with very low amounts of losses. And then there's an injection of the uh, wave energy into the tokamak plasma. More specifically, to give you an idea of the parameters of the ECRA system, we have uh, two subsystems. The one, the second harmonic uh, uh, X mode, 
This is exactly the scheme of operation we have illustrated in simple terms a few minutes ago. We refer to that as X2. The actual frequency is about 83 gigahertz. There are six uh, sources at this frequency, each one having half a megawatt. And we inject that their power through uh, side launchers, both to heat the plasma in the determined locations inside the tokamak and to launch waves with a particular direction, therefore to drive the current in a plasma, which referred to as the ECCD scheme, electron cyclotron current drive scheme. Second harmonic X mode has a cutoff density of few times 10 to the 19th per cubic meter. If we see the top view of the injection points of the tokamak, we can see that by moving uh, the uh, steering mirror, we can in fact give an angle to the injection of the wave and determine the propagation in one direction or the other, and therefore determine also uh, current drive in one direction or the other. Current drive it can be off axis or, or on axis, depending again on the choice of the injection uh, geometry. The second subsystem that we have is the system working at the third harmonic X mode referred to as X3. The frequency is, in this case, 118 gigahertz. We have, so far, three sources of uh, half a megawatt each, and they are injected from the top. As I said before, in a very qualitative terms, as we increase the harmonic number, so as we go higher and higher in the frequency, the absorption efficiency is less and less. And that's exactly why we inject from the top, so we have actually more plasma to go through in order for the absorption to reach uh, good levels, even at the third harmonic. The advantage of the third harmonic is that its cutoff density, that is the density above which the wave cannot penetrate to the core, is higher, and it is about 1.2 10 to the 20 per cubic meter. So we do inject these waves, first of all, to heat the plasma, and how does the plasma respond? And uh, I'd like really to show just one very simple example. This is the profile of the electron temperature expressed in millions of degrees. In the ohmic situation, that is the plasma which is only heated by the electrical current flowing in it, we have a fairly low and even fairly flat temperature profile. If we inject these waves at the second harmonic of the X mode, then we have very peak and very high profile reaching values about 150 millions of degrees. Another important point that was uh, discovered in a number of uh, experiments including TCV is that using ECRH power locally deposited in particular points in the plasma some instabilities can be controlled or even suppressed completely. That's the case of the so-called Terry modes which are uh, instabilities that develop in the core of the plasma and provide a change even in the topology of the plasma creating islands in the magnetic fields inside the plasma and therefore losing, uh, leading to a loss of heat from the core of the plasma. You can see in uh, this movie that this uh, instability can develop in the TCV tokamak and can uh, actually lead to a degradation of its performance. The point is that if we can inject a microwave beam exactly on top of that instability, the details of the interaction between the beam and the magnetic island are too complicated to be discussed in this course, we can actually eliminate this instability, eliminate this bubble that leads to degradation of performance. Let's now look at the ECRS system as it is uh, being developed for ITER. Now ITER has a higher magnetic field than TCV, so it would be very hard, if not impossible, to find sources of uh, microwaves at uh, the second or third harmonic of the FCE. And that's why we're actually working with the so-called O1 scheme, that is the first scheme we have seen together the ordinary mode being injected to uh, deposit energy at the fundamental frequency F equal FCE. You need to that corresponds to uh, 170 gigahertz. The system foresees 
24 gyrotons for 1 megawatt each in continuous wave operation, that's uh, of course 24 megawatt, they will be used for a number of things in addition to heating, for ionizing the plasma to begin with and initiate the discharge, of course to heat the core of the plasma, to drive current non-inductively, to control the plasma current profile and uh, um, lengthen the ohmic pulse eventually. And as we have seen in the example of TCV, very importantly, to control the instability development. In fact, in ITER, this will be the primary goal of the ECRH system. Here you see an image of the layout of the system with the gyrotron sources, um, will be 24 of them, quite far away from the tokamak um, hole, a set of transmission lines, and a set of launchers for injecting the power into the tokamak plasma. There will be one equatorial launcher to inject the power at the equatorial plane of ITER. And besides the detail we which, into which we will not go, um, I like to notice there's a steerable mirror so that there's a toroidal steering range from 20 to 45 degrees in a toroidal direction. This is a development that's been undertaken in Japan. And there will be a launcher from the top of the device, referred to as the upper launcher, which is being developed in a European context. And that launcher, which uh, in TCV would be uh, about a meter long, in this case is uh, almost five meters long, something that weighs 50 tons, and it has to pass eight times one megawatt beam. And again, the electron cycle frequency for ITER core, which is about 170 gigahertz. So the idea here is to be able to steer in real time the microwave beam to locally heat and stabilize the plasma instability in the same way we have discussed before. It's important to preserve the focusing of this beam even after a very long uh, travel from the original source so that the uh, beam can be injected in a very localized way and a resonant surface and have a very good current drive efficiency for the local cure of the instability. So let me just briefly discuss the advantages and disadvantages as I see them, sort of a personal point of view, of ECRH heating and current drive for ether but also in general for uh, fusion reactors. First of all, the high frequency of ECRH allows a quasi-optical propagation, so you can have a source that's very far away from the plasma. There is no need for an universal antenna. There's a high degree of flexibility which allows localized heating and current drive and therefore a very good degree of capability of controlling instabilities locally in the plasma. There's a, an intrinsic uh, advantage, at least very important potential advantage in the high electrical efficiency of the uh, sources for microwaves. They are foreseen to go up to 50% in efficiency, which is very important for, of course, for the fusion reactor in the future. Some drawbacks can be mentioned. There is still the issue of the density cutoffs, which are different in different schemes. So we cannot heat above a certain density. And of course, electron suction resonant heating heat electrons which don't provide fusion reactions. So we will have to have a, a collision of transfer of electron energy to ion energy after we have deposited our heating to the electrons using ECRH. And I'd like to mention that uh, the question of the reliability of the uh, high frequency and high power sources being addressed at the moment, the hope is to go to very high levels of reliability in the future so that will become actually a pro rather than a con. So it's sort of a summary of uh, these uh, three lectures on uh, additional heating of the plasma. I put here a table with the systems foreseen for ITER that in a sense summarizes the state of the art in this field. For ITER we are foreseen to have a neutral beam injector with a power of uh, 33 megawatt. Of course we can't define the frequency for that. It's not based on the wave principle. That's for heating and current drive. We have a, a nice rich system of 20 megawatts 
with a frequency between 40 and 55 megahertz resonating with the ion species in the core of the ether plasma, mostly for heating. We are anticipating to install the low hybrid heating and current drive system, but only in the second stage. So that's not the system that's foreseen for the uh, first stage of the ITER operation. Also, with a power of about 20 megawatts, and a frequency corresponding to the low hybrid uh, wave in the core of the ITER plasma of about 5 gigahertz. Finally, we also uh, preparing an ITER system which will have 24 megawatts of power, as we have seen, at a frequency of 170 gigahertz. And the reason why I have put this in green is that this is the only system that would be needed for day one of the ITER operation. We are now ready to very briefly summarize this lecture. We have seen that ECRH waves are used to heat bulk electrons and to drive current in a plasma. The high frequency of this wave leads to quasi-optical properties of them and to local absorption, which is essential for heating, for driving current, and for controlling instabilities in the plasma. There's no need for universal antennas, so all the problems we have discussed for ice rich and lower habit waves um, are overcome. And, of course, the ECRH system is foreseen in ITER for ionizing the plasma to begin with, for heating the plasma, for driving current in the plasma, and most importantly, for controlling these instabilities.